put the rivet. I'm not seeing, okay, so the participants are starting to uh, populate. I just uh, want to say happy Mother's Day Monday, everyone. Lovely to see our leadership from across the state and uh, people gathering from all over the country, really, to hear our incredible speakers today. And this event is made possible by the support of our collaboration, uh, which is, um, has been building now since, to some extent, since 2006. Uh, we had our first public meeting in 2008, and uh, we have gathered support from uh, various departments of the state of California, especially the California Department of Public Health, the Office of the Patient Advocate, the Department of Managed Health Care. Uh, we have participants from Los Angeles Public Health, Stroke Awareness Foundation, Blue Shield of California, the Tennis Getter family, the Dupereau family, uh, various UCs. Stanford, USC, University of Southern California, and of course the California chapter of the American College of Cardiology. We also have wonderful support from our uh, Health Trust of Santa Clara County, uh, the Community Health Partnership, and uh, from our biopharma uh, partners who are, I should say, supporters uh, who we are all so grateful to be alive because of their work to bring us this blessing of the vaccine against the pandemic. So thank you to our biopharma uh, um, supporters and scientists and the intellect that has saved us all from our demise this year. Uh, next slide, please. Most of you know me. Um, and I bring my training from the University of California, Davis, from which our uh, chairman, uh, Bill Bomber, hails, and also from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, where I learned to drive policy change with data. And it has really had a big impact, and I'm grateful to my wonderful um, supporters at Harvard. So I want to say that in our... Uh, entire existence, we have focused on uh, driving down heart attacks, stroke, diabetes, heart failure, um, and this year we added um, SARS-CoV-2, of course. Our approach has been to um, focus on three critical metrics. I call it the holy trinity of the Right Care Initiative, and that is controlling hypertension, controlling cholesterol, controlling blood sugar, and to do proactive community outreach to screen and identify vulnerable patients and connect them to treatment and support. Next slide, please. This work has really mattered. By driving those three uh, biometrics, we were able to uh, drive down acute myocardial infarction hospitalization by more than 20% uh, through getting all of the medical groups in one region to reach 75% control of those three metrics, cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar. Next slide, please. What we do is we gather people to learn best practices of how you do it. And we learn it from those who have done it and done it well. So our approach is to activate the patient, to, to teach the, the known protocols of what works, to add uh, critical team members, especially the very muscular team member, which is the clinical pharmacist on the care team. And today we'll be learning about another team member that uh, we have not uh, fully deployed, which is the community health workers, including the promotoras and even the barbershop uh, project, where we need to deploy those who have influence, positive influence over patients. Next slide, please. 
I want to introduce our brilliant uh, statewide chairman, Dr. Bill Bomber, who first trained in physics before going into medicine. He's trained most of the cardiologists in the capital region, many of whom have spread across California and beyond. Uh, he <laughs> has such a storied uh, background, including over a thousand papers, hundreds of awards, scientific publications, and now over a hundred university of best practices that he's led. Next slide, please. Bill, you're on. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone on our post uh, Mother's Day uh, uh, session today. Uh, and congratulations to all those mothers who had hopefully a very relaxing weekend uh, this past weekend and everything was taken care of. Um, we're uh, <clears throat> presentation today is shown here and we're going to focus on a couple of things, uh, chronic kidney disease with uh, Dr. Campisi, uh, Oliver Brooks on release the pressure. And then we're going to talk about the integration of community health workers <clears throat> with uh, Brenda Lee uh, Rodriguez and Margarita Holgren uh, that will be f winding up the uh, program as we go through it. So if we go, could go to the next slide, <clears throat> uh, remember that one of the Right Care uh, Initiative principles initia initially issued by Warren Barnes uh, was to compete against disease, not each other. So we are literally competing or fighting against disease. And that is our, uh, our mentor uh, listed that uh, outline for us. Next slide. <clears throat> so based on that, uh, why are we uh, talking about uh, fighting uh, cardiovascular disease? You saw our, our uh, initial <clears throat> uh, slide showed uh, preventing heart attacks, strokes, and diabetes. So where does kidney disease fit in all of this? Uh, well, you can see on the, uh, on the left that uh, kidney disease um, is really uh, what I would call the canary in the coal mine. Kidneys affect our, uh, pres our pristine vascular organs and early disease in the cardiovascular system can express itself first as kidney disease, both proteinuria or reduced uh, GFR in those individuals. And sometimes kidney disease is the first sign we have that there's a problem with the vascular uh, system of the body. So it's an early canary and sometimes a signal. And no wonder that we look at <clears throat> GFR as a sign or a risk factor when assessing individuals who are undergoing cardiac surgery, general surgery, cardiac interventions. Uh, and it is a, in general a risk factor because it represents uh, and is the early marker in many cases of early disease. So it's no coincidence that on the left on the top, that the risk factors for cardiovascular and cerebral disease, that is high blood pressure, diabetes, you can see on the left upper screen, constitute almost two thirds of the risk factors for kidney disease. So the same hypertension and diabetes that cause cardiovascular disease are also causative in the, uh, the leading cases of causation for renal disease as well. So we're playing in the same area for this. And on the right, you can see that about one in three people with diabetes may have chronic kidney disease. So it's prevalent in diabetes, about 33%, also prevalent in individuals who have just hypertension. So there is a clear or close relationship to, to that. So as we discuss the relationship you could say, why do kidney disease now? It is closely related to cardiovascular disease. And that's why we're bringing in a distinguished lecturer today to discuss renal disease as we go into it. And to introduce that uh, lecture today, I have the uh, privilege of introducing the, our chairman from Southern California, uh, Steve Chen, 
Uh, and I would say he basically doesn't need an introduction. Why is that? Well, if I walk into any pharmacy in California and I ask, do you know Steve Chen? My, the answer is always, oh yes, of course we know Steve Chen. So this individual is known throughout the state uh, in, in every pharmacy within miles of every individual household in uh, California for that. Now, I should also mention that Steve is a Trojan from USC, <clears throat> and that plays a part as well, because as you know, the Trojans were in fact uh, known for getting into the community in different ways, but uh, they were able to get into the city of Troy. And so Steve is very effective in getting into the community as he leads the community and he's in charge of that for USC, for that teaching. And Steve is very involved in getting pharmacists more involved with the community and team approach to continue to fight disease. In fact, fight is his motto. In fact, his song is fight on as a USC Trojan. So he can sing that song for us maybe at the end of the program today, we'll see. But anyways, <clears throat> we're delighted to continue the Right Care Initiative Warren Barnes principle of fighting disease with Steve's rendition of it, which is fight on for disease. And with that, I would like to introduce our next speaker. Here's Steve. Dr. Bomber, thank you. Uh, the only reason why anyone would, would know my name across pharmacies is if I violated some kind of uh, board of pharmacy law. So I don't think that's entirely true. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I am very, very excited uh, to have Dr. Vito Campisi speak with us today. Uh, I just want to share with you a little story of how I first met Dr. Campisi. Uh, I joined uh, the USC School of Pharmacy 20 plus years ago. And my very first continuing education program I was headlined with Dr. Campisi talking about uh, hypertension treatment updates. And I was so excited. Uh, this is out in Lake Tahoe. Uh, so it was, it was a very cold, wintry time and, and Tahoe got there. And the next day I found out that he wasn't coming. They couldn't find him. No one could find Dr. Campisi. I was first and foremost concerned about his health. Uh, and then we had to quickly shift and figure out how do we give this program without Dr. Campisi? So of course, being a new faculty member, I thought, oh, we'll, we'll do the best we can, it'll work out. And we got through the day, got pretty decent reviews. And I thought, well, that worked out pretty well. And then a couple of months later, I, I had another chance to have Dr. Campisi at one of our programs. And I heard him speak for the first time. And when he finished, I realized that we ripped off everybody in Lake Tahoe. They missed out on just an amazing presentation and update on hypertension. I've heard him speak so many times after that uh, I learned something new from every time. Uh, there's another time I remember he spoke to us where he said at the beginning, uh, we need to finish on time because Italy is playing in the World Cup. And he gave the most beautiful presentation and finished right on time. Didn't miss a thing. Uh, so, and I, I think unfortunately Italy didn't win that game. So I'm sorry, Dr. Campisi. Uh, but, but we are so thrilled to have truly an international expert in kidney disease speaking to us uh, about his topic. So um, maybe we can go to the next slide and uh, do we have more? Oh, I think Dr. Barm is going to continue. Is that right? No, you're you're you've made your introduction. I think. Okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so with that, we're both delighted to introduce Dr. Campisi, who will be providing us with really relevant and uh, I think thought-provoking insights into renal disease and where we're going. In the, in the future with this. Uh, so Dr. Campisi. Thank you very much and uh, good morning to all, uh, good afternoon to all of you. I need the... Uh, uh... Yeah, so the host will allow you to share screen. Okay. I don't see the screen. We can see your screen. Um... You right, can, so you see. just need to select your presentation there. Down okay, on the here we go. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much again for uh, the nice introduction. I get straight into the, the topic. What uh, really, the scope of my presentation is, first of all, to see how human species have evolved uh, over the millennia 
And uh, but the, the interest in doing so is to see how really uh, the changes that have occurred in the evolution of a species have impacted also um, uh, the environment and public health. Um, and uh, then more specifically, I want to talk about how these environmental changes that have occurred over the uh, millennia and particularly during the last few centuries have impacted on uh, cardiovascular disease and kidney disease. And then I want to get into an epidemic of chronic kidney disease that is going on, or going on around the world in part related to factors you know of and Dr. Bowman alluded to, uh, diabetes, hypertension. I would add to that list, Dr. Bomer, dyslipidemia. This is another unrecognized cause of chronic kidney disease. Uh, but um, I'm going to primarily look at the impact of the environment on the epidemic of chronic kidney disease, because really it's an aspect of the, of the problem that has not received adequate attention. So uh, human beings have evolved uh, over the millennia, of course, we know that, um, but human being and environment are strictly interrelated in a very dynamic, but also fragile equilibrium. Humans have struggled for survival, have faced environmental challenges, epidemic, exposure to various toxins and try to survive all of this. But at the same time, human beings have had a tremendous impact on the environment. And uh, particularly in the last three centuries, two and a half centuries. And uh, at this is really affecting um, our life and will affect even more our life in the future. So uh, human species derived from uh, apes, we all know, uh, and the Homo erectus goes back to 1.4 or so uh, million years ago. Homo sapiens um, came out only 200, only 200,000 years ago and separated from the Neanderthalians here about, uh, again, 200, a little bit more than 200,000 years. Now the Neanderthal species, which is an hominoid species, disappeared about 30,000 years uh, um, uh, ago. So the only humanoid species that has left is the Homo sapiens species. Now, uh, the early ancestor diverged from apes about five million years ago, and then between two and a half millions and 10,000 years ago, it sounds a lot, it's not. If we look at the, uh, the, the duration of the universe is 13.8 billion year, billions years, 10,000 years are nothing, okay? so. The uh, hominids lived uh, between the 2.5 million and 10,000 years ago, uh, a nomadic life. They moved from place to place, searching for food, for better climate, and trying to survive primarily. And then we go to 10 year, 10,000 years ago, the Neolithic phase, when human beings start looking at the importance of settling down. And this came about with the development of agriculture and also with the, with the um, domestication of animals. So uh, since they learn how to make their own food and not just to search for food that was available in nature, but to make their own food and also to uh, domesticate animals for their own good, um, they start having a, a, a much more stationary life and not a nomadic, a nomadic life. The beginning of civilization of the current civilization goes back to 4,000 years ago with the Egyptians, the Greek, um, cultures and so on and so forth. And these have had tremendous impact in the evolution. Along the evolution of species, of humanoid species, there have been huge migration and we forget that. Uh, everything starts in Africa, particularly in southwestern portion of Africa. And then humanoids migrated north. And from there they went prime, first in the Middle East about 200,000 years ago, then to India 70,000 years ago. They arrived in Newport 40,000 years ago. And the United States, they did not arrive with Columbus, as we all know, but they arrived 15,000 years ago, and in Australia about 50,000 years ago. So, all uh, in these 200,000 uh, uh, years of human um, um, sapiens life, there have been tremendous migration, and believe it or not, these migrations are dictated by um, economical. Uh, and uh, primarily for the struggle, by the struggle for survival, uh, searching for food and for a better climate. And this cannot be really stopped, can be contained, but they cannot be stopped. 
Uh, now there is evidence of uh, uh, agricultural life in the Mesopotamia uh, era, 10,000 years BCE, and the Egyptians were well known. They had a very well developed agriculture. So then we come after all of this, so millions of years, uh, then 200,000 years, the, 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 human, the, the uh, Homo sapiens uh, era. But the major really change in the evolution of human species occurred about 250 years ago with the industrial revolution, okay? What happened with the industrial revolution? Well, there are four phases of the industrial revolution. In the first phase during the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, this took place primarily in Europe and America. The iron and textile uh, industries were developed along with the development of steam engine. Then in the second phase, 1870, 1914, steel, oil and electricity, toll, telephone, photograph, internal combustion engines, all these were developed. Then we come to the third uh, phase, 1980, to the present with the digital revolution, internet, information, communication technology. And then we come to today, the fourth phase of the industrial revolution with development of robotics, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, quantum computing, and you saw so internet. And these are part, all these technologies are part of our life. One revolution that we um, disregard, it uh, has been the green revolution. This has had also tremendous impact in public health. This occurred very recently in 1950, when Norman Borlow, Nobel Prize for uh, uh, Peace, Nobel Peace Prize, uh, he got the Nobel Prize because he's the first one who realized that large part of the world were dying, guess of what? Of starvation. And we had to feed, and they are still dying today, many people uh, of starvation. So he realized that really we had to change our approach to uh, um, agriculture. And so introduced chemical fertilizer, agrochemicals, pesticides, herbicides, improve the irrigation and mechanization of the process of, uh, of uh, agriculture. High yielding hybridized seeds were developed in order again to make uh, uh, cereals, uh, more cereals, bigger cereals and so on and so forth. So all of this initiative has had a tremendous impact on uh, uh, public health because it's increased the supplies of grain, has led to cheaper livestock, and is creating it, and it's credited with saving over 1 billion people in the world due to starvation. So a tremendous impact, positive impact. But we had to ask ourselves at what cost all this industrial revolution, as well as the green revolution, what has been the cost of these very rapid changes over a period of 250 years? Well, and the changes have been tremendous, okay? There has been a transformation from manual labor up to, to 250 years ago, everything was manual. And now progressively everything is based on machinery and computer. So all of this has led to more sedentary life. We move less, okay? And you can understand the consequences of that. Then there is also increased availability of food, cheap, abundant, and we are eating more and more and more. So we are moving less, we are eating more. Okay, and you understand the consequences of this, of that. Increased pollution in the environment, all consequent of the industrial revolution as well as the agricultural revolution, because we are using all these chemicals, all these fumes in the atmosphere. So there is increased exposure to poisoning. And finally, one fourth factor is the use of new medicine and the diagnostic agents. These also have contributed to prolonging life, but they've introduced a new array of poison in the environment and in our body as well. So these are our cities now. It's the way they look, okay? Uh, this is China. Uh, this is China on a bad day and a, in, a, in a good day. And uh, these are the, this is what we see coming out of the chimneys of our industries. And also the agriculture is contributing to all of this by herbicides, uh, dust and so on and so forth. It uh, certainly spreads these herbicides, insecticides, and fertilizer. So uh, all these changes um, uh, are due to, uh, again, the continuous and increasing rate of exploitation of natural resources, industrialization, 
technological growth and plan urbanization are all responsible for great environmental crisis and ecological imbalance. And the global warming is, an, is one expression of all of this. Now, global warming is nothing new in the evolution of uh, species. If you go again from 400,000 years ago to today, and you look at the temperature, there have been ups and downs of about averages ups and down, um, even 10 degrees. And we're going through glacial phases and interglacial phases on and off. The last glacial phase was less than 30,000 years ago, so about 19,000 years ago. And since then, the temperature has been going, going and up and up and up. But there is no doubt in the last 50 years or so, the rise of this curve has accelerated tremendously, and that is really reason for major concern. So uh, all this has occurred. It's all, some of these things are great, uh, but some are not. And be careful, because nature is vengeful, vengeful against those that try to subvert it. Many animal species have been wiped out from Earth. Even the Homo sapiens, the Neanderthal, Neanderthal uh, Homo sapiens has been wiped out, and so the dinosaurs. Humanoids are no exception. Okay, it's happened for many species. It can happen to the humanoid if you are not very, very careful. So, what has been the impact of these revolutions on public health? Okay, on one hand, the total world population has increased tremendously. When the human, uh, the um, the Homo sapiens uh, came about. 200,000 years BC, there were only 10,000 people on the surface of Earth. Now there are close to 8 billion people, all right? In the 1800, there was 1 billion. In such a short time, we're going from 1 billion to 8 billion. Life expectancy, the Homo sapiens had a life expectancy of 15 years. In the 18th century, in the, in, in the 19th century, in 1800 and on, the life expectancy, the average life expectancy was 35 years. Now the average life expectancy is 67 years. And in most industrialized countries, including the United States, is over 80 years now. So tremendous impact on world population, on average life expectancy, but uh, uh, there have been drawbacks. For once, what has been the impact of smog on mortality? The WHO estimates that 92% of the world's population live in places where the air is below uh, uh, the set levels for uh, WHO, the quality of air, okay? In Europe, it has estimated the exposure to excessive uh, particulate matter more than 2.5 micromoles, the so-called PM 2.5, cause more than 400,000 premature death per year. In China, in 2010, excessive uh, PM 2.5 caused more than 1.2 million deaths compared to 10 years earlier, okay? So in 10 years, uh, uh, more than 1.2 million deaths. So all this has had consequences. One of the consequences, of course, as I said, has been more sedentary life. And one of the consequences has been in the United States and all over the world, uh, there is more and more obesity, okay? Here you see the trend of obesity going from 1904 to 2009. Yeah, I cannot read that well. And uh, you see the colors are going from uh, light colors to darker, darker colors, meaning the prevalence of obesity has increased more and more and more. And currently in the United States, it is estimated that 25% of the population is obese. Another 45, 50% is overweight. So you have two thirds of the American population it is overweight. And this trend, again, it's not unique to the United States. The trend of obesity has driven the trend of uh, the epidemic of diabetes, the same thing. Now about 10, 12% of the American population has diabetes. And you saw this from Dr. Bomer already that this has led also to more kidney disease and uh, the kidneys and the cardiovascular system, as you heard, are strictly interrelated and the uh, kidney disease caused by cardiovascular disease and vice versa. And now you, about 40, 47% of patients on dialysis have diabetes as primary diagnosis. So uh, <clears throat> we have had, again, a tremendous impact on uh, cardiovascular disease and renal disease. Before I go on though, the organizer of this have uh, asked me 
to give you, uh, you a few to share with you a few concepts about what chronic kidney, chronic kidney disease is all about and how we go to recognizing it. And I think it's important to do so because in our day-to-day -day practice, we are making a few uh, mistakes in this particular field. So what is chronic kidney disease? Chronic kidney disease is a condition that affects the kidneys with the potential to cause either progressive loss of kidney function or complication resulting for decreased frank, uh, kidney function vis-a-vis -vis cardiovascular disease. Kidney disease, cause or aggravate cardiovascular disease. So um, one of the, uh, the uh, kidney is defined as kidney damage for three months or more, defined by structural or functional abnormalities of the kidney manifested either by pathological abnormalities or by markers of kidney damage, such as alteration in the markers in the blood, in the urine, imaging, um, or protein in the urine. A GFR less than 60 ml per minute for more than three months also defines chronic kidney disease. The National Kidney Foundation defines kidney disease based on stages. Stage one, kidney damage with normal kidney, normal GFR, GFR more than 90. That means if you have a radiological evidence of polycystic kidney disease, GFR is 90, you have chronic kidney disease. Or if you have proteinuria and you have a GFR over 90, you have chronic kidney disease. Stage two is the same thing, but with GFR between 60 and 89. Stage three is GFR between 30 and 59. G stage four, GFR between 15 and 29. And kidney failure and stage kidney disease when the GFR goes below 15 ml per minute. And most of the patients, when they reach these levels, they are close or they need dialysis. But one thing I want to share with you, are we using the right sensors to detect chronic in the disease? What do we use to detect insulin disease? Well, ideally, to measure GFR, we should be doing annulin clearance. Annulin is just sugar that is filtered freely by the kidney, is not reabsorbed, is not secreted, so is the ideal molecule to determine GFR. But annulin is not even available anymore in the United States. It's available in some countries around the world, but in the United States, you cannot get it. And it's very difficult to do. All you have to do radionuclide measurements, which are tedious and costly. And so what do we do? Okay, in order to, uh, to measure kidney function, either we measure creatinine clearance or we measure serum creatinine, okay? Uh, the creatinine in the blood though, or serum creatinine that we uh, largely use in, um, instead of uh, 24 hour urine collection to measure clearance, is serum creatinine is highly lab dependent. And in other words, if you go to the same lab uh, from a day to day, there is very little variability. But from, if you go from one lab to another, there may be even substantial liability. So one thing you should tell your patient is to try to go to the same lab. Also, there's a fallacy about what is normal creatinine. And you read the lab value 0.8, 1.2. And so if the creatinine of your patient is within that range, we see, we, you say, well, uh, kidney function, serum creatinine is normal, hence kidney function is normal. Now, well, I threw down for you some example here, just to make a case. Take a patient who weighs 50 kilos, has a creatinine of one milligram per day, okay? His GFR, if he has one gram of creatinine in the urine, usually we produce about 20, 30 milligrams of creatinine per kilo per day, all right? And so his GFR will be 70, if he has one gram of creatinine in the urine with the serum creatinine of one, he would have a GFR of 70. Take a patient now with 75 kilos, he produced two grams of creatinine, all right? If his serum creatinine is still one, his GFR will be 140. Take Shaquille O'Neal, he pays over, weighs over 100 kilos, he probably produced three grams of creatinine. If you, in, in, and so his creatinine in the urine is three grams. If, you, if his serum creatinine is one, his GFR will be 210 ml per minute. So you have three individuals who have the same serum creatinine and they have such a spread of GFR. I'm raising this issue because you cannot, you cannot 
when you look at serocreatinine, not to take into account what the muscle mass of your patient is. So if you have a lady or a patient who is uh, a 90 and weighs 40, 45 kilos, and the serum creatinine is one, you cannot conclude that patient has normal serum creatinine or normal kidney function. The kidney function in that patient is tremendously altered. You take a pregnant woman, comes to you with a creatinine of one, the woman needs immediate medical attention, immediate, because normal serum creatinine in, pre in pregnancy should be 0 0.5 or so, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and should not be one. So don't get trapped into numbers uh, because numbers can mislead you most of the time. Creatinine comes from muscles, okay? It's a metabolite of creatine. Creatinine is built in the liver, but then goes in the muscle, it's phosphorylated, it's important for contraction. And creatinine, uh, it, it comes from creatine. The amount of creatinine we excrete in urine is a direct function of how much we produce and what we produce is from muscles, okay? Also, another thing that I want to point out to you, if you look at the relationship in this slide between GFR here on the x-axis and serum creatinine, you notice that when you go from GFR of 100 all the way down to GFR of 60, serum creatinine changes a tiny bit, only slowly and very little. It's only when you go below 40 or male GFR, now you see an exponential increase in creatinine. So once again, serum creatinine can fool you very, very easily. You can go from 0 0.8 to 1.2, which is still within normal range, and that patient has lost 50% of his kidney function, and still, quote unquote, his creatinine is within normal range. So the other thing is, of course, is to measure creatinine clearance. But now you have to collect urine, 24 hour urine, and urine collection depends on the age of patient, gender, muscle mass, diet, and also more importantly for urine collection, it's very difficult to do. So uh, it's difficult, okay? Serum creatinine can mislead you. You collect 24 hour urine uh, samples, collect you. And so we resort to uh, estimating GFR, which is what all the labs are doing, as in using the, either using the Cotcroft for Gold formula, the old formula, or using the MDRD formula that we use nowadays. But keep in mind this formula it's not that correct in many patients. This was this study was done, the MDRD study was done in patients who were younger than 70, older than 18. So you cannot apply this formula to people who are older than 70 or younger than 18. You cannot apply the MDRD formula to people who have CHF, who don't move, have a little, little, little muscle mass. You cannot apply to patients with liver disease. You cannot apply people who have cancer and they've lost a huge muscle mass. So you need to use this formula with a lot of grain of salt because they can mislead you very, very frequently. So lastly, macrobiominuria, what is it? Macrobiominuria, we all measure nowadays and there is a lot of misconception out there. A macrobiominuria is not an albumin of smaller size, defines a range of urine albumin excretion, which is within non-detectable level by obviously. Let me be more clear. When you put the stick in the urine, the abu stick, to detect albumin, if that stick comes back positive, that your patient has more than 300 milligrams roughly of urine protein excretion per day, roughly I'm saying, or 300 per liter of urine, okay? If it's not, the dipstick is negative, does not mean the patient does not have abnormal urine excretion. If the patient, if the patient is urine abuse excision between 30 milligrams and 300 milligrams, the abuse stick won't tell you that, but urine abuse excretion determination will tell you that you have a problem, which is macrobiominuria. So in, ex, in expression of kidney disease, it does not necessarily predict progression of kidney disease. I don't have time to dig on this, but it predicts certainly cardiovascular disease and mortality as, we, as the Dr. Bomero pointed out to you. You're looking at survival over time, and you look at cardiovascular mortality, these are patients with normal albumin excretion, macrobiominuria, decreased survival, macrobiominuria, decreased survival, even further. So the take home message is that CKD is defined by a GFR less than 60 for at least three months. GFR should be estimated from serum creatinine using the MDRD formula, but clinicians should be aware of overestimation when GFR is near 
for over 60 ml. Uh, uh, and also in Asia, these for the in Asia, these formulas are not good. Um, the prevalence of CKD is uncertain, it's probably 10 13 percent of the adult population is CKD. Although macrobiomin is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, it should not be used to define chronic kidney disease, even though the National Kidney Foundation says to do so. Uh, CKD is associated with increased cardiovascular disease and that CKD is also a risk factor for progression of end stage to end stage renal disease, but about one fourth of patients do not progress. Okay, so I've given you now a cap on what kidney disease is. Let me go back to my main topic here, and that is kidneys uh, and these changes in the environment. Briefly, I told you about how the kidney are influenced by cardiovascular, metabolic disease, and so on and so forth. But another factor, so big player, in causing chronic kidney disease that has not received adequate attention up to now, and I'm glad actually I'm giving the opportunity today to share these thoughts with you, is what has been the impact of the environment on environmental factors, not just impact on environmental factor on diet, sedentary life. I'm talking about the environment directly impacting on kidney disease. Well, the kidneys are unique in the body because they have a tremendous amount of blood flow. Indeed, uh, about 12, 1,200 ml blood flows through the kidneys in one minute. That's 25% of cardiac output, okay? 25% of cardiac output in one minute goes through the kidney. Why, that, why is the kidney, why that's so? Well, the eye flow is necessary for filtration. You need all that blood to flow through the kidney in order to establish to maintain a filtration rate of 100, 120 ml per minute. The blood though is distributed primarily to the cortex, exactly because the cortex is the part of the kidney where you have the filtration. In the inner medulla, only 1% of blood reaches the inner medulla. So the inner medulla is actually, uh, it, it gets enough blood to, for oxygenation, but it's a, 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 an area of the kidneys which is pretty, um, a critical can be injured relatively easy when there is decrease in blood pressure or decrease in blood flow all the way to the medulla, okay? Uh, now the kidneys are particularly because of this increase in blood flow, huge blood flow, and because of the fact the kidneys are able to concentrate uh, the filtrate uh, from uh, 180 liters per day down to one liter of urine per day. So there is a tremendous uh, 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 concentration um, occurring in the kidney, uh, uh, there are consequences for that, okay? The, given the secretory and excretory function and also the hyperosmolarity in medulla, the kidneys are very susceptible to a lot of type of injuries. A co immune complexes that circulate in the blood, they sink in the kidneys, environmental toxins, they get concentrated in the kidneys, drugs that we take, uh, for non-steroidal drug, antibiotics, you name it, okay? Re uh, they all concentrate in the kidneys. So they are more likely to injure the kidney. The drugs, uh, some of uh, uh, many people use for recreational purposes, heroin, cocaine, and amphetamine, they concentrate in the kidneys. Radio contrast, diagnostic agents we use in our day-to-day -day, uh, practice, they concentrate in the kidneys. Now, guess why? the kidneys can be injured by all these things because they are in the blood, they reach the kidney in high quantity, they concentrate in the kidney and there you have it, okay? The consequences you can just imagine. Now, there is, the kidneys in fact are pretty susceptible to all kinds of uh, uh, environmental injuries. Here you have the association between urbanization, urbanization and reduced kidney function, uh, in, in, uh, in China, okay? And this study has showed a positive association between urbanization and reduced kidney function. In other words, people who live in the cities, they are more likely to develop kidney disease than those who live in the countryside, okay? In this study in Taiwan, uh, there was, the, <coughs> in a very large um, study, they found high correlation uh, between the concentration of the eight metals in the environment, in the uh, uh, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, mercury, copper, lead, nickel, and zinc, and the risk of end ending up on dialysis. A study in the United States, huge study, 
this was done in the VAA system. Over 2.4 million veterans were included in this analysis. And what they did was to look at the risk of progression of kidney disease and the amount of air pollution in, the, in their environment. After they left the army, they went back in their own uh, part uh, in the countries. And then afterward, they looked at this study and they look at what's the impact of being exposed to different um, uh, environment of different concentration of air pollution and chronic kidney disease. And you see that the more, the more uh, uh, particulate matter where in the air where these people live, the greater the probability of developing chronic kidney disease. And certain areas of the United States in red are more susceptible than others in terms of air pollution. So air pollution indeed can cause increased mortality and cause more uh, kidney disease. Now in the history of nephrology, we know that there have been epidemics of chronic kidney disease tightly linked to environmental factors. At the beginning of the 20th century in Australia and Queensland, uh, there was an epidemic of chronic disease. I'm sorry, this is wrong. It's due to lead, okay? Was after, after some time, they discovered it was due to lead. In Japan, there have been several epidemic of chronic kidney disease going from 1910 to 1960s. And finally, they found academia to be responsible for this epidemic. In the Balkans, for years, they were afflicted by an epidemic of chronic disease called Balkan nephropathy. What is this Balkan nephropathy? Well, it was an epidemic of chronic kidney disease due to tubal interstitial disease in rural, which occurred primarily in rural villages located in the valleys near the Danube River and the tributaries of the Danube River. Bosnia, Bulgaria, Croatia, Romania, Serbia, they were all affected, okay? And people were dying from chronic disease and nobody knew why. This was uh, unknown for many years. So uh, they knew that the occurrence was focal in some village where it was happening, in nearby villages was not happening. It occurred in family, but there was no genetic though uh, transmission of the disease. It occurred in individuals older than 18 uh, uh, years of age. And there was a strong association with upper urinary tract transitional cells cancer. Okay, and again, this was undiscovered for many years. This was the region, it was a large region of East Europe affected by this uh, uh, epidemic of chronic kidney disease until the light started to come out. And there was a, an investigator, actually was a veterinarian, who drew attention to the fact that in Croatia, nephrotoxicity was common in horses, <clears throat> and in horses that ingested hay contaminated with a weed called Aristolochia clematitis. Okay, this is a plant a week that grows along with the with the uh, with the hay. So he said, "Well, is there an association here between eating this weed and uh, and uh, uh, chronic kidney disease in horses?" Now, this work, of course, was an observation by a veterinarian. Uh, doctors don't look at the literature, veterinarian literature. They should look more probably. And so for many years, this went uh, unobserved until another, this time a uh, 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 medical doctor, Dr. Ivich, he uh, came up with an intriguing hypothesis. He said, well, since seed of the Aristolochia clematitis uh, commingled with wheat grain during the harvest, uh, 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 a toxic, is it possible that the toxic constituent of this plant plant that is called Aristolochia might be causing this epidemic, okay? He raised an hypothesis, he had no proofs. Nonetheless, his hypothesis went totally unrecognized and disregarded for 35 years, okay? While people were dying, nobody was doing anything until uh, an American, Grohlman, he went in the region and he said, well, let me see what's going on, okay? And he started collecting kidney biopsy and the kidney biopsy of people who were dying from this disease indeed discovered metabolite of Aristolochia, okay? And so he indeed raised the, uh, or he has the first demonstration that Aristolochia accumulated in the kidney and indeed was causing tubal interstitial arthritis. Also he looked at the urothelial cancer cells and he found a mutation that he eventually demonstrated was caused by Aristolochia. So here we have the end of the story, the Balkan nephropathy, 
was caused exclusively by a contaminant in the environment, contaminant that was generated by a weed, okay? Now, interestingly, this weed was not unknown. It had been known for millennia. Aristolochia species had been used widely for more than 2,000 years in Japan. In Japanese medicine, they used to make medicine with Aristolochia, as well as in Europe, in Latin America, in the United States. During the Roman Greek Empire, they made recipes, herbal recipes with Aristolochia in amount that now we know they, are, they were toxic. Nonetheless, they claim these were doing many good things. And even uh, recently, they were thinking that they were doing a lot of uh, uh, good things until in Belgium, in, in the, the publication of, was in the 2000, but the epidemic occurred uh, uh, in the 1992, I think it was. In Belgium, they noticed that uh, 112 women who had bought or had used Chinese herbs to lose weight, they actually developed horrendous kidney disease, urethral cancers, and most of them died from uh, this particular disease, all caused by Aristolochia contamination, okay? Now, this should, subsequently, similar cases have been described all over the world, including the China, but all over the world. So now the, the um, Chinese, so-called Chinese herbal nephropathy it's, uh, uh, you can find it in any uh, nephrology textbook is well recognized entity, but all start with the Balkan nephropathy and then this epidemic in Belgium. And now we know indeed that these herbs uh, can be uh, lethal as far as the kidney is concerned. Now, another epidemic of chronic kidney disease has now occurred in the last uh, two to three decades affecting the entire world. Okay, and the problem is 30 years ago, after 30 years, we still don't know what's going on. Okay, after once again, we are facing an epidemic of chronic kidney disease and still we don't know what's going on. In fact, it's called chronic kidney disease of uncertain origin. Where is it, where is, has, been, has it been found? It's been found almost all over, but particularly in Central America here. Has been found in, uh, uh, several countries in uh, uh, Africa and Tunisia, sub-Saharan um, countries, in India, Sri Lanka, has been found in Taiwan, described in Taiwan, and the more they look, the more they found this disease. So, uh, the first description of this uh, so-called epidemic was in Central America. In fact, originally was called the Mesoamerican nephropathy, Meso, the Central American nephropathy. Uh, the first formal mention of this disease was published in 2002, not 50 years ago, 2002, when Trabanino reported that 67% of patients with chronic kidney disease in El Salvador had a disease of unknown origin, not diabetes, not hypertension, unknown origin. Subsequently, uh, several other investigators all over Central America have reported similar problems, okay? And as of, as of now, it is estimated 30,000 young people have died from this disease. Occurs predominantly along the Pacific Rim, much less in the hills. Affects primarily young men working. At the beginning, they thought it was people working only in sugarcane mills. Now they know that we know the miners, construction workers, fishing industry, port workers, brick makers, women also, much less than men and children also. Uh, one study has looked at uh, uh, children of age between 10 and 13, and they've uh, looked at markers of kidney injury in the kidneys and found markers of kidney injury in the urine of these children. So originally it was in the, the epidemic was described in sugarcane mills. I've been there a few times now because I'm uh, directly interested in this epidemic. And to look at the way these workers work, it's really un unbearable even to look at. They burn the sugar cane uh, at the time of harvest. They burn the sugar cane. Then the next day, they have to cut the, them, collect them. And the, the, the environment is so dusty, so they, they look black at the end of the day. I mean, they're all completely covered by smoke. And it's really unbearable even to look at it, okay? Uh, so. Uh, 
some colleagues of mine, fellows of mine who uh, are, have continued to collaborate with, with me from Italy, they've done a survey of 10% of general population in a, in a city in Malpaisillo in Nicaragua, where I've been going uh, to study this problem. And it's a town of 26,000 people. They've um, selected one tenth of the population and, and screened one tenth of the population. They found that 27% of the population, this is a young population, 27% have chronic kidney disease, okay? 35% of those have uh, hyperuricemia. And if you look at the urine, they found mineral protein urea, some mucosides, and nothing else really, okay? The disease presents asymptomatic in most of the people. Sometimes people present with the symptoms of uremia and stage kidney disease. Blood pressure is usually normal. Protein urea is minimal. They often have hyperuricemia, they often have hypokalemia, and histologically they have tubular interstitial nephritis. Once again, okay, tubular interstitial. When you are dealing with poisons, it's usually tubular interstitial nephritis. Okay, it's, a, it's a more present at, at sea level than in the hills. I won't bother you, I come back to this concept, and can present occasion with acute kidney injury. Uh, most of the time, a chronic kidney disease, in some cases, with acute kidney injuries. Now, let me concentrate now in the remaining time. What is going on? What is killing young workers in Central America, in Africa, in Sri Lanka? That's the still open question, and that's why we still call it disease of uncertain origin, okay? Originally, the suspicion was, might be, an infectious disease. And indeed, in Nicaragua or Central America, leptospirosis, antivirus are endemic. So uh, a colleague of mine uh, who works at Dallas, actually, she went into the field and she collected uh, 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 specimens of water, of everything, to look for uh, uh, leptospirosis. Indeed, when they burn the canes, there are lots of uh, rats. In the living in the sugarcane mills because they like sugar. And so they feed on uh, sugarcane. And when you burn the canes, a, a lot of them, a lot of rats die. In fact, I walked through this field and it's amazing how I many rats, you, dead rats you see. And they, uh, and leptospirosis is endemic among rats, okay? Well, uh, Murphy in Dallas, she studied the issue is it le uh, leptospirosis? Is this antivirus? And to make a long story short, it's not, because if you look at people with the disease and those without the disease, the prevalence of leptospirosis was, was identical. So it's not infectious disease. Then the people thought, well, people who work in the field, they usually have aches and pain. They, have, uh, they take a lot of acetaminophen, a lot of ibuprofen, diclofenac. Uh, could this be responsible for chronic kidney disease? And the answer is probably not because the relationship that we and others have looked at, it's very uh, uh, weak. So what are the preponderant hypotheses nowadays? Okay, there are two school of thoughts. One school of thought says that the mechan mechanisms of Mesoamerican nephropathy is linked primarily to dehydration. In other words, these individuals work in farms where it's very hot, the conditions are very uh, humid, they sweat a lot, uh, they get dehydrated, uric acid in the blood as a consequence of dehydration goes up, they release hormones during, after dehydration that may cause tubular injury, so high uric acid, volume depletion, uh, hyperuricemia, they all concur, uh, because this occurred day after day after day, the, the harvesting season goes from November to May, uh, this caused recurrent AKI, minor kidney injury, the buildup and chronic kidney disease. This is one overwhelming hypothesis. The second hypothesis uh, that I actually have uh, uh, proposed, and many people agree with me on this, is the Mesoamerican property uh, is caused not by dehydration or not exclusive by, exclusive by dehydration, but over hydration, by rehydration. What do I mean by this, okay? Well, we start from the fact that these uh, workers get dehydrated. 
dehydration lead to reduced renal perfusion, concentrated renal medulla. Now, if you rehydrate yourself with contaminated water, remember, I don't know whether you know this or not, but in most part of Nicaragua, for example, where I've been, people drink water from wells. And wells get easily contaminated from uh, agricultural fields where you won't believe it, I mean, I mean herbicides, insecticides, anides of any sort, they, they fertilize, uh, they, uh, they put in, the, in this land. So if you drink a lot of water in a day, and these people drink 10, eight, between eight and 12 liters of water a day, eight to 12 liters of water a day, so if you drink eight to 12 liters of water a day of contaminated water in a day, even if the concentration of poisons may not be that high, in a day you really are ingesting a, re a tremendous amount of poisons that in the context of reduced perfusion and concentrated medulla may lead to accumulation of toxin in the renal tubules, okay? And the accumulation of toxin in renal tubules cause renal injuries, okay? So some say it's dehydration, dehydration, dehydration. I say it's dehydration, yes, but in, the, in, in concomitant with the administration of poisons, primarily through the drinking water. What is the proof of this, okay? We don't have any direct proof of uh, what I'm saying. However, one thing I've done in Nicaragua, I've convinced the owner of the largest uh, sugarcane mill in Nicaragua, he owns 27,000 uh, uh, hectares of land, all, uh, uh, all um, uh, harvested in uh, sugar, sugar, sugar cane. And we follow the patients. They have about 7,000, 7,000 workers. In 2017, 2018, between 2017 and 18, they implemented uh, supplements, forced supplemental uh, water to workers. They had to drink one liter of water, tap water, per day, and they had to stay 10 minutes uh, every hour under shades. And so they implemented these things, and the number of acute kidney injury, case of acute kidney injury, uh, was 242 in 2017, went down a little bit in 2022, but not much. At this point, in, between 2018 and, and 2019, I convinced the owner of this uh, farm to implement a purified water system. So workers were getting only purified water. And the cases have gone down in 2019-103. This year, last year, up to May, of, uh, up to April of this year, only 51 cases. So one fourth, one fifth of cases. So just by purifying water, the number of the, has gone down tremendously. Now, the uh, why to fight for these two theories? Well, there are practical implications. If you believe in the dehydration only theory, all you have to do really to give workers uh, water, tap water, wells water, and you forget about it. If you have to give workers purified water in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Costa Rica, now you have to impose the fact, because not just workers in, the, in the, these fields are contaminated, get contaminated by the entire population, now you have to force the politicians to implement systems of purifying water for entire countries. It's a huge, huge undertaking, huge undertaking. It's not easy to accept uh, what I'm saying, okay? Now, a proof also that the lesion may be due to poison come from a study done by uh, work by um, Dr. Debrode in Belgium. He is look at histologies of people who have this disease. And they found some alteration of lysosomes. They are very similar to uh, alteration you find when you give patients cyclosporin A, either because of transplants or because of immune, as an immune suppressive agent. And these are the alterations. These patients develop pretty unique uh, alteration in the kidney. These are lysosomes, which are huge with these micro dark particle inside. And these lesions are seen only with cyclosporin or are seen only in patients who have this nephropathy that I'm telling you. In fact, the broad has taken kidney biopsy from patients now a different part of, of the world, 
uh, from uh, Peru, Central America, uh, in, in Africa as well. And he found these lesions in all the patients with so-called renal disease of unknown etiology, this peculiar lesion that are seen with cyclosporin and with this, uh, with this contaminant. And these days proof that some insecticides are potent inhibitor of calcineurin, and therefore they can cause these lesions. Herbicides such as paraquat can cause similar lesions and so on and so forth. So uh, to summarize, there is a symbiosis between human environment. And uh, this, uh, this symbiosis has become more and more precarious over the years. A growing number of diseases are caused by environmental factors, both cardiovascular, but also kidney disease. The kidney are particularly susceptible to environmental insults because of the, of the fact that they get a lot of blood flow per minute and they concentrate whatever goes in. An epidemic of chronic disease of a normal proportion is affecting several regions in Central America, Asia, and Africa. The disease affects primarily young workers subjected to strenuous heat and working conditions, can progress rapidly. The cause remains unknown, but it's my belief that environmental toxins in conjunction with dehydration, these, these factors may be critical factors in uh, spreading the disease. And alt lastly, is calcineurin inhibitor, inhibition a common pathway that links this poison to the disease. This remains to be established. Okay, thank you very much for uh, your attention. And I'll be glad to take any question that you may have. Is anybody there? Everybody fall, fell asleep? Yes, we're here. Hattie, oh. we can't hear you. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you very much for that uh, great presentation. Uh, this is fascinating um, and uh, potentially, uh, you know, it uh, in, impacts a large population in the, in the world today. And uh, as you said, uh, it's a costly intervention to try to filter this. Uh, what type of filtration did you do at your farm where you showed the significant reduction in the uh, prevalence of the uh, interstitial disease? What type of filtration yeah. was implemented? They, uh, the owner of the factory implemented, uh, uh, on my suggestion, an RO system. What he does, they, they, calcify, they, cal they calcify the water and then they run the water through an RO system. He bought a huge system and now he's buying more and more huge systems because now he's getting into, he's an entrepreneur, he's getting into the um, <laughs> business of selling. Uh, uh, not just sugar cane and rum, he makes uh, uh, fantastic rum. Uh, and, uh, but he also is getting into the business of selling uh, purified water, uh, which is good. I mean, you know, because uh, uh, he can help the populace, population this way. Uh, so it's an RO system. So is this well, well water that is contaminated and then it, it has all of these uh, toxins or is it yeah. surface water? No, it's, uh, these are wells uh, that are uh, uh, pretty superficial, most of them, um, not well attended to. Uh, some, just by looking at them, you know that there, are, there is contaminated. Just by looking at them, you know that they're contaminated. And another phenomenon that they have in Nicaragua is they have, a, it's a pretty volcanic region and they have uh, infiltration from uh, volcanic lava of the underground. And uh, as you know, lava contains all kinds of baby metals and so on and so forth. We are now in the process of, uh, of looking at what's in the water. And uh, uh, we have also collected nails from workers in the field. And we found increased concentration of a variety of metals, arsenic, uh, cadmium, um, and others. Uh, we have not published the, this data, but we are uh, continuing to study the problem. I'd like to do a follow-up question to that. And that is in our situation in California, could you talk about uh, commercially available water purification systems that we might uh, 
to be able to better deploy to address our kidney disease here? Well, the uh, purified water, i.e. water run through our road system, uh, is, is the best water to drink. Um, the water we get uh, from uh, Colorado, uh, it gets checked. Um, and there are there is stuff there, but it's below the, uh, always they tell you it's below the li a certain limit, okay? They set the limit, uh, the uh, risky limit. The problem is it depends on how much you drink the water, how much water you drink in a day. Because if you drink one liter of water a day, and you are below the limit, you are fine. If you, lick, if you drink 10, 12 liters of water per day that is below the limit, then it's not fine because you are, you are drinking 10 times the water below the limits. It becomes water above the limits that way. And that's the point I was making, um, what I think may be going on in Central America among these workers. So have you looked at uh, water that we buy at grocery stores to see if it is okay for your kidneys. I've never thought of it before. No, I've not looked at, again, you know, they, uh, they look at those things. The um, authorities, the, 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 uh, they are supposed to do so. They, they look at concentration of uh, arsenic, uh, heavy metals. They look at those and they, they, uh, they allow the water to be used only if the limits are below a certain recommended value. So ordinarily, so the water should be okay. If you drink one, two liters of water per day, one and a half liter of water per day, the limit should be okay. If you drink uh, purified water, bottled water, uh, we drink primarily water uh, collected in plastic uh, bottles, and I have a problem. I drink that, but I must say uh, I have perplexity about water preserved in, in plastic bottles. They are kept everywhere in the heat and so on and so forth. And uh, I don't know what plastic might eventually do. I'm suspicious though of plastic. But I don't know, I don't have an answer. It, well, it's an absolutely intriguing lecture, uh, uh, beautifully done. Thank you so much. And um, I think we unfortunately don't have a lot more time for questions because we have, uh, several other great speakers with us. Dr. Campisi, what a delight to meet you and learn about your research. And we hope to learn more from you about uh, your great knowledge in uh, difficult to treat hypertension. Thank so you. Uh, I welcome you to stay with us uh, as we learn from Dr. Oliver Brooks uh, about a very practical program that he is helping to lead. Um, and with that, uh, Dr. Bomber, would you please do the introduction? Um, great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Campisi, for a very fascinating uh, uh, um, uh, evaluation of both our roots and uh, the direction that we're going. And, uh, and hopefully uh, we can alter that direction to uh, continue uh, health for, uh, for uh, humanoids. Um, so our next program uh, that also relates to renal disease is the importance of hypertension and hypertension, as we saw earlier, was the number two leading cause of chronic kidney disease in the United States uh, for that. And uh, <clears throat> I'm delighted to introduce Oliver Brooks, who is the <clears throat> a co-chair and he is the media past president of the National Medical Association. And he is the chief medical officer for the Watts Healthcare Corporation in LA. And he has participated in some innovative uh, research. Los Angeles was uh, responsible, as we remember, for the barbershop hypertension control, a way to get pharmacists out to uh, barbershops and had uh, Tremendous success uh, with that. And Oliver is going to tell us about his program, <clears throat> reaching out to hypertensive uh, patients, uh, release the pressure. And we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Oliver 
Brooks uh, make this presentation. Oliver. All right, well, thank you very much, <clears throat> um, you know, um, Dr. Bonner. Uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Campisi, that was, that was an excellent, excellent lecture. Um, and I like the fact that you started with the uh, development of, his, of uh, Homo sapiens. Uh, there's a book called Sapiens. So people that like that, you must read that. Yeah. It's, it's a okay. must. Um, and uh, he made a couple of points that are relevant to, to my presentation. And, and I, will, I will note them as we go through the slides. Uh, so uh, Megan, can we go forward with the slides? All right, thank you. So this is a program called Release the Pressure. I presented this, I want to say, ooh, a while, a while ago here uh, at right here, and this is an update. Uh, next slide. So it's a program to get black women to address their hypertension. So it's about creating a space for black women to know that they're supported, that there they're are those that are out there. Um, there is often the issue uh, that in the um, black community may not have the, uh, a PCP, uh, may not be as up to date on something like monitoring your blood pressure because of the social determinants of health lead you away from things that that more concerned with uh, transportation, housing, education. Uh, so this plan was devised by six uh, partners, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, next slide. So why is this an issue? So I pulled this from um, the Office of Minority Health. Uh, they have an Office of Minority Health in all of the six HHS um, subcategories, sub uh, offices. So the, the ratios to the far right show based on the majority population in the United States, the ratio of uh, Black hypertension prevalence versus white. So, and then these numbers are the percent of the population, which is really amazing, which you, if you look at this, 57% of the total uh, black population are hypertensive, 43% of the white population. So both those numbers are extremely high, but you see for black women, they're one and a half times more likely to be hypertensive Black men just 1 more 0.1, but overall 1.3. So it is, it is an issue. It is something that needs to be addressed. And as we saw again, second leading cause of CKD. So if you don't treat your hypertension, you end up with CKD, heart disease, et cetera. Next slide. So death rates. So again, uh, this is per 100,000. So uh, men, black men have 1.3 times more likely chance of dying from hypertension. Women the same, excuse me, from heart disease, all, all causes. And the same as uh, black women. So again, there is a significant disproportional effect of hypertension on black women and death from cardiovascular disease on black men and women. Uh, next slide. So th these are our six pa uh, partners. Next slide. So uh, keep going. So part of a college. So the AMA were the ones that initiated this, along with the AMA Foundation, who was funding the project. So they came to us and said, "We we've, we've gotten with the American Heart Association because we want to address this issue of hypertension and the African American community, and we've decided to focus on uh, Black women for the reasons I just showed you: higher rates of hypertension, one and a half times." Uh, so next slide. So when it came to, when I say us, at this point in time, I was president of the National Medical Association um, and we promote the collective interests of the African-American physician and the African-American community, which differentiates us a little bit from the AMA who is primarily focused on uh, physicians. Uh, Associated Black Cardiologists, uh, prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease and student, including stroke and Blacks and other minorities. And the doctor that began uh, the Association of Black Cardiologists, a black cardiologist named um, uh, William, uh, I'm forgetting his last name, uh, but he um, he wrote the book. There's a there was a book, the um, bio the uh, biography of um, 
Black Diseases, which became the first book that demonstrated the disproportionate effect either through genetics or uh, social determinants of health uh, with African Americans. Um, and that became a, a novel book that was utilized by uh, CDC uh, and others to determine and better research uh, that. And then he started the Minority Health Institute uh, to advance the health and wellness of communities uh, of color and those in financial need. Next slide. So who was managing this program is a group called Converge, a black woman owned social justice consulting firm. So they, they were hired by the AMA, AMA Foundation to manage this release to pressure uh, program. And uh, Idlewild is who has been hired to promote the program. And that doctor's name, which is just came to me, is Dr. Richard Allen Williams. He's a Los Angeles based cardiologist. Next slide. Right, so the goals of our return of release to pressure uh, program. Next slide. So in the broad view, the overarching goal is by 2025, 5 million black female adults with hypertension have their blood pressure uh, meet their goal, have their blood pressure under control. The way that that is to occur is the second level of the pyramid. 300,000 take a return to the pressure, a release the pressure pledge. 75,000 uh, watch a self measured blood pressure training video and track their blood pressure and 40,000 to engage with their physicians. So the thought is with the spread of these 300,000 to take the pledge, they will bring others along and this will reach the goal of 5 million black women reducing their blood pressure. And, and this is one place where what um, Dr. Campisi presented was really interesting. There's a statistic that I knew that 70% of African-Americans live in an area that is considered having the worst air quality. And he stated urbanization leads to CKD. And that was very compelling information. His study was from China that he, that he provided but I presume the same findings occur here. So the fact that African-Americans are living in an area uh, where the air is bad, and so they're um, filtering all these heavy metals and, and can potentially lead to CKD, uh, that is significant. The other slide he showed was the rate of obesity in the United States and how it increased over time. But he didn't say, which was on the slide, though, is the highest rates of obesity were in what we call the animated obesity belt coming through the South, starting around North Carolina, coming down through Florida and over to Louisiana. And that's where a large number of, of African Americans live. So the higher rates of obesity and the higher rates of being exposed to uh, poor air lead to CKD and therefore uh, hypertension. So it's all the more important that we focus on this and probably why, one of the reasons why the rates for hypertension are higher among the African-American community. So in terms of getting to what we want to do, so the activity metrics that we monitor, social media touches, virtual events, a traditional media outreach, email distribution and website uh, views. So next slide. So the pledge that we ask these women to take and that they do take is they, they a pledge to release the pressure to uh, set a blood pressure goal with a healthcare professional, monitor blood pressure at home, activate a wellness plan, which is in conjunction with their physician to determine what it is that they would do to get well, which would, for example, include um, reducing obesity, uh, more sleep, being adherent to your blood pressure regimen in terms of medications. I mean, you all know that 65% of African Americans need two medications at least to get their blood pressure under control. So it's one thing that we let them know is that any, anyone who has, um, who is, is hypertensive and African Americans should likely be on two minutes, well, two thirds should be on two medications. Uh, and then checking with their squad. So that's when you bring other people in to your now more health conscious approach to your blood pressure. Next slide. Megan, next thing. Yeah, so this is a training video and I'll show you some stats on how many of the women have actually watched this, but it gives training on how to do self-managed um, self, um, self -managed blood pressure. 
uh, very important because it's interesting looking at the three rungs of the Right Care Initiative, which I appreciate Hattie showing at the beginning or uh, discussing at the beginning, three of them were proactive outreach, uh, intensive patient care and home blood pressure monitoring. So this program addresses directly two of the three primary uh, avenues that Right Care utilizes, proactive outreach and home blood pressure monitoring. And so a focus of our program is home blood pressure uh, monitoring, self-managed blood pressure. Next slide. So currently our metrics are, we've had 6,117 take the pledge. The video, which is more, you know, almost 60,000 uh, women have viewed that video that I just discussed. You have 345 Instagram followers, almost 3,000 website views, and seven day challenges is another part of what we do um, so far. Um, I will note that this was conceived back in the beginning of 2020, late 2019. Our partner at that time was Essence Magazine. Essence Magazine has a wellness festival and that's well, an Essence Festival in New Orleans where a quarter of a million uh, people come. So the plan was to take this to Essence Festival and we were going to expose, we expected to get about 40,000 touches in the program. That did not occur obviously because of COVID. So we are a little behind as far as I'm concerned in our metrics because COVID affected just the health and well being of the country and obviously programs such as this. Next slide. Next slide, Megan, please. All right, so these are our current metrics as of uh, the 29th, what about two weeks ago uh, of April. Uh, again, the total uh, taking the pledge that week, well, this is for that one week at 2,500 to the place. These are the other touches in terms of what we monitor on the website. These are process measures, not outcome measures, but that's what we have to date. And next slide. So right now, again, the, as we said, we have 6,100 women, 6,117 that have actually taken the pledge. And you have to be somewhat engaged to take the pledge. And that's actually a good part. I mean, these women have shown that they are going to take the step to you know, sign a pledge and have a degree of commitment. And how much follow through that is, we'll be monitoring that ongoing because we can monitor their touches. Next slide. So some of the uh, training videos in, in touching through uh, through, e through uh, the web, internet access to the uh, release the pressure site. Uh, this is again, self-management uh, blood pressure, 59,000 to the right views of this new, uh, new video, national uh, virtual vision board, black women make history, artist therapy. So these are, and you'll see these are some of the uh, interactions, interventions that have been done to try to, again, allow the women to get connected uh, and to actually do activity with, that would reduce their blood pressure. Putting yourself first. There's a lot of burden in the black community on the black woman. There's a lot of focus there for on taking care of yourself in addition to taking care of others. Next slide. Next slide. So some of the events and initiatives, so weathering, erosion by racism panel. This is a panel that was done November 18th. And I don't know how well it's known, but there are studies that show through the effects of uh, racism in the United States, or let's just say when you look at African-Americans, when you look at their, uh, their cellular age, it is advanced relative to a, a control uh, a person of the same age and gender that, that was white. And what you see is the telomeres are shorter. And so there is this concept of weathering where over time we do see uh, this. So part of that is from stress. And so there is a lot of focus on reducing stress by uh, certain activities. Uh, this national vision board was another activity that was done where the women would just visualize better health and they were guided through this. Next slide. Uh, and then art as therapy, again, reducing your stress. And then this Her Heart Summit, this was just this week, and I don't know what the metrics are in terms of attendance on this particular event. Next slide. So move forward, next slide. So what we're looking at as we move forward, uh, 
practice what you preach this is going to be another uh, intervention where we, this information is on the website and we ask the women to uh, take the pledge and share the message. Um, well, this, this is say with your patients. So this was actually for physicians. So we've also reached out to physicians uh, through the National Medical Association to be aware of this and to uh, direct your, uh, your black women patients as they come in to say, well, there is this program release the pressure. You might wanna check it out. Uh, email, contact, um, they, uh, stressing that the women share the message with their squad via social, social media. Uh, and again, a squad is just your friends and family and community outreach through events such as I showed you the web. And as we move toward more face-to-face, -to -face, we will have more face-to-face -face community outreach events. And we are creating more content on a monthly basis uh, as we work through this program. And the partners, six of us meet quarterly to review the metrics and look at other potential interventions as we move through the program. And next slide, I believe that was it. So, all right, so thank you. So um, the reps, the website is releasethepressure.org. So if anyone's interested, you can go there and uh, look at it, review it. You can also take the pledge if you so desire. So I'll, I'll stop there um, and I'm gonna turn it back to, uh, turn it over to Bob Trine to introduce the uh, the next speakers, and I presume I'll get I'll take questions after the next uh, presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brooks, and thank you for everything that you do in in Watts and LA County and California and throughout the country. I don't know how you uh, you get it all done. All right, thank you. So now we're gonna turn our attention from one important uh, group, the African-American community to another, the Latinx community. And here we're going to focus on the use of uh, community health workers as a vital tool in engaging and, and progressing care within that community. We were fortunate to have two leaders in this field uh, with us today. I'm gonna to introduce them both and then turn it over to Brenda Lee. So Ms. Brenda Lee Rodriguez has, has worked in this area uh, in Florida, in Texas, and now in Southern California, um, a, a key player in developing the operating model and how to, how to make communi uh, community health workers programs work. And she'll be talking to us um, on a couple of different operating models for that. Thank you for that. And then that will be followed by Margarita Helguin, who uh, precedes um, Brenda Lee uh, to Chula Vista in, uh, in South San Diego County, and who has since been working statewide and internationally in the similar area. So we're very fortunate to have two leaders with us today to talk us through this, to describe the model, the what, the why, the how, and, and what kind of impact uh, this program can have on the, uh, on the AAA, cost, clinical quality, and satisfaction. With that, Brenda Lee, take it away. <laughs> Thank you. And I really appreciate the opportunity to follow this uh, magnificent uh, program and the previous two speakers going from the macro level at the world uh, uh, stage, bringing it home to the US with a specific program and, and African Americans. And on several of his slides, we'll talk about education and um, uh, the health plans. And I'm going to now talk about more about who can assist your patients with those health plans and uh, medication adherent regimens and all that. And those are the community health workers and patient navigators. I have uh, uploaded uh, some links in the chat. So that is also for your further review. Uh, we are here as we, we move forward in 2021, a uh, moment to recognize all those impacted with the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have seen how promotores how really has stepped up to the plate and played a public health role here. Uh, and now more and more as we have uh, are containing the pandemic, also to continue the work with the chronic disease management and the telehealth readiness and support for our patients. Next slide. 
I will briefly uh, go on, on some context, a discussion of the CHWs and patient navigators on the uh, service delivery, a little bit of research that I've been part of in clinical interventions in the US, and uh, we'll make the link with Margarita's presentation with more about the social determinants of health and some specific programs. Next slide. And uh, as per the American Public Health Association definition of community health workers, they are that trusted member that has that link to the community because of those close understanding linguistically, historically, ethnicity, all those linkages, and even patients themselves uh, that aim to provide not only uh, those linkages, but also more social support and advocacy. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the links that I shared with you on the chat is about this, uh, the Health and Human Services Action Plan to reduce racial and ethnic health disparities, where this plan actually uh, mentions explicitly the role of the CHWs, promotores de salud, and patient navigators in health. And you will see all that alphabet soup of agencies that follow up on that plan uh, with programs specifically incorporating those uh, members of the healthcare team and providing funding for such programs. Next slide. With uh, the uh, availability and more increased um, spotlight on community health workers, we're focusing now on uh, towards integration. And there were uh, several moments uh, that uh, really facilitated this transition because they have been here for a while uh, but now uh, in the recent years, more uh, emphasis and more integration. One of these was the standard occupational classification code that was put together in recognition as health professionals. Also in 2020 with the Affordable Care Act, uh, they were integrated uh, with uh, into the preventative services and management of chronic diseases uh, language and uh, more and more uh, state innovation models incorporated them into and linked them with uh, improvement of self health outcomes. Next slide. And as uh, we all know, they have been properly documented all the work that uh, community health workers can do in service delivery and because of their natural direct interaction with the populations. But also now uh, we are adding uh, more to the core competencies uh, for these individuals. Core competencies have included advocacy, communication skills, cultural uh, responsiveness, education, facilitation skills, and more. We are adding evaluation, research and specific uh, knowledge about a condition or a disease. That's all on top of their uh, original outreach uh, and skills. Next slide. And uh, despite uh, that rich history of providing those essential services, uh, a little bit they have been uh, experiencing marginalizations from other healthcare providers. And uh, we want to, and when I say we, the work that I was doing statewide in Florida and here since last year is uh, moving it forward to a more formal recognition of this public health workforce. Hence, I am here with you today. And, um, as the healthcare shifts from uh, to value or outcomes-based payment models, yes, we do need to demand a more advanced health equity increase uh, with the recognition of this emerging <laughs> occupation. Next slide, please. Some information from the Bureau of Primary Healthcare. Yes, they are listed. And again, some of that uh, in pivotal work by creating a professional code uh, for the classification of this uh, position. Let me tell you more data uh, about California. Well, in general, teams of CHWs are growing all around the US. Uh, there are uh, there is an anticipated growth of 13% from 2019 to 2029. And in California, there is an estimate of 5,960 
CHWs employed as of May uh, this day, last year before COVID, right? This estimate is from the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics and accounts for paid CHW. So we are not counting volunteers and other promotores de salud. So therefore the number is higher with a mean average wage of $25.45. $25.45, that's more than the national average of 2212. And uh, in terms of the mean wage per year, again, California leads uh, at 52,000 over the national average of 46,000. And uh, California is the second of five states with the highest employment level of CHWs in 2020. Uh, it follows New York, Texas, uh, uh, Washington, and Massachusetts. Next slide, please. Here is more uh, with now the emphasis, and this is the angle that I'm bringing to you, interventions and research. And there is more about that on the community guide. Uh, a screenshot of their website is there. Next slide. I'm going through this because uh, very fast because I know that uh, also Margarita Olguin will be sharing more information on this with you. And um, the CDC Road to Health Toolkit uh, is a key um, book for the implementation and integration on, within healthcare settings. And uh, it usually uh, discusses uh, any program with CHWs and integrated into healthcare will include a description of a coordinated family-centered community-based education program with client service coordination uh, that will result in improved health outcomes. For example, relevant to these discussions today, BMI, glucose levels, blood pressure, and usually uh, there has been a lot of, of documentation of this uh, for, with individuals with type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Next slide. And uh, indeed the CHW can help you with your patient segmentation because it does have um, the link there to support your high risk patients. Right, uh, they, they provide that psychological support and resources, especially to isolated patients that are now in COVID and after COVID. Care coordination, uh, and uh, especially with those of, with complex health needs, improving those linkages to care, whether it's in person and now more and more in the virtual and telemedicine world. Next slide, please. So here is more information about those innovation models and the evidence. So I share with you another link in the chat or a two pager is very uh, succinct and to the point with systematic reviews of CHW's intervention, whether they were on randomized control trials, whether they are um, ROIs or return on investment studies on CHW interventions and uh, those, although not done in California, they range between $2 to $50 for every dollar spent. And uh, another set of articles will inc include success in uh, rural settings. So it, it's, it's a powerful two-pager. Next slide, please. And uh, from the macro, going to the work that I was uh, supporting back in Florida, a, with some uh, CHWs in clinical interventions, comparing the usual care, and all this was uh, NIH funded. Um, that is uh, the Miami Health Fee Heart Initiative. And uh, those various models uh, that integrate that into healthcare, we really were focusing on Latino patients, a, and looking at the impact of the CHW intervention on intermediate outcomes. We developed a cariño uh, CHW intervention. In Spanish, cariño means uh, love, caring. So it was very pertinent for the model using community health workers. 
and uh, not only publications of, for JAMA, for uh, um, health affairs and, and all those which were done, but also we wanted to create products for CHWs by CHWs in assisting Latino patients. One of those examples is right there uh, available uh, free of charge to you online. Next slide. And those include some of the uh, papers that are uh, readily available to you online uh, regarding this particular intervention. Next slide. As a synopsis, we integrated CHWs. I know it's hard to see, uh, but then when you get the slides, you're gonna see it more clearly. And uh, in the goal setting of the intervention plan per uh, patient, also in conducting those phone calls, follow-ups, connecting with patients. Also the community referrals, addressing those uh, extra social determinants of health factors that include uh, housing, food scarcity, and transportation and other um, elements. And definitely with the telehealth, uh, implementing a text-based program, monitoring the high blood pressure of patients after education sessions and a blue, uh, monitors and equipment was provided by the CHW to the patient. Next slide. There are some uh, stats that you can easily read uh, on the web page, on the uh, um, published articles. Next slide. And just to highlight what the CHW intervention Cariño provided, yes, we were able to reach more participants than the usual care. Uh, visits, visits were conducted at home. This was pre-COVID, of course. And uh, the blood pressure monitors and the texting backup and education, including videos, were put together and actually gave results on um, lowering the blood pressure and providing mental health support, uh, also educating on other related um, health matters in connection with social services that were enabling patients to be adherent to their health action plans. Next slide. And for this from Florida coming to San Diego, uh, I will just briefly uh, mention this neighborhood navigator model, uh, and Margarita will talk more about this one. This is part of the Chula Vista Community Collaborative Network that she uh, preceded me in leading uh, with five uh, family resource centers, and we are part of uh, this uh, model that includes all the geographical areas here. We have the CHW patient uh, care coordinator, we have a manager, uh, those staff are supervised, trained in not only core competencies, but also disease specific and um, HIPAA regulation, uh, protection of human subjects, all that extra level of dedicated structured training. Uh, the team also adds a RN care manager uh, for this model. Next slide, please. And this is quite uh, broad. I wanted to tell you more about this case study regarding some uh, family members. But uh, what I wanted to emphasize for today's and the given time allotted is the crucial role that uh, CHWs have been providing during COVID times, with, especially with these high-risk patients that have been more isolated, maintaining a consistent outreach with them, assisting them with the referrals to COVID testing sites, food banks, a vaccination options, education, and avoiding misinformation, clarifying those myths a, about um, the COVID vaccines, and linking them to our family resource centers in Chula Vista, among others. Next slide. The power of patient voice. I want that will be my takeaway message for you today. The power of patient voice within the healthcare systems. Uh, it does include having the community health worker, patient navigator in your team. You can read more about that in this ebook available online. Next slide. 
And in wrapping up with uh, these notions of addressing healthcare disparities, yes, equality sounds fair, giving uh, the same measure stick to everybody. That sounds fair, but equity is fair, and that is providing its specialized targeted interventions and tools for our patients. And uh, let me tell you, CSWs and patient navigators really make health equity happen, addressing those social determinants of health. N next slide and final slide. Thank you very much. Here's my contact information. And again, check out those links in the webpage, in the chat box. What a lovely presentation. Thank you so much. I, I believe that uh, Bob Trine will be doing the, in, the introduction. Thank you, Bob. And thank you so much, Brenda Lee. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much, Brenda Lee. And I'm, I'm going to do this quickly to give the stage to Margarita. But um, Mar as I mentioned, Margarita was directing this, the similar program in uh, Chula Vista. That's the southern part of uh, San Diego County along the Mexican border. Uh, but now is working across the state and beyond internationally, as I understand it. So, uh, and with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to um, Margarita Hogan to talk, and especially to drill into the evidence um, of uh, impacting positively the triple aim with what they've been able to do with um, community health workers. Go ahead, Margarita. Great. I will go ahead and get started. I'm going to try and share my screen now. not allowing me to share, I apologize. I don't see why it's not allowing me to share. No, I, if you don't mind just to save time, go ahead and, and share it yourself. It's not allowing me to share my screen. Okay, Megan, if you wanna go ahead and Okay, proceed. thank you. I wanted to avoid asking you to continue to uh, advance the slides, but that's fine. Um, so as I was introduced, Margarita Ogin, and I'm happy to share with you a little bit more about the work that has been done um, and integrating community health workers and promotores as members of the healthcare team. Next. And so we have been hearing about team-based care, and we know that it truly does offer an opportunity to improve healthcare. There has been a lot of research on that, and it's been quoted as an approach to achieve better health outcomes at lower cost. So we know that it is an approach that works. And everything that I'm citing here, you have a slide at the end that will give you all the sightings, and I hope you get a chance to look at some of that, those reports, because it truly, there's a lot of learning from that. Next. So the community health workers really provide an important role when we come to bridging the language and cultural gaps. So they are part of a care care being part of a healthcare team, they really provide this add-on value. They bring experience-based expertise. This is a peer model. Therefore, those uh, community health workers or promotores that are working on these teams have experienced very similar um, life um, situations as those patients that they're working with. The CHW is an intervention that in many reports and in a lot of the data that we're seeing has been proven to improve uh, chronic disease management. And um, there's some benefits to the patient by having a community health worker on their side, on their team. Um, so we hear that there is that difficulty of caring for the most needy and the most vulnerable populations. Next. So how do they contribute to the team? They truly provide this strengthening of the patient and provider communication. They're the ones that function as mediators. Uh, they, again, they bring this experience that they already have. They know they face very similar challenges and barriers as a population that they're serving. So they can speak to them in a more peer-to-peer -peer, um, relationship. They are able to motivate them to really facilitate their um, 
programs and facilitate them getting to programs and connecting with those programs. So they really do help coordinate and increase access to various social services and health services. And we know that social determinants of health are increasingly recognized as so important in really addressing health. Health is beyond the clinical setting, must also address the social determinants and life issues. So they do uh, we know that the community health workers increase the patient's use of preventive services, which is what then decreases the, the cost for many um, healthcare systems. And again, um, there's a lot of reports that cite this evidence. Next. Continuing with their uh, contribution, they provide, they help clients adopt a more positive behavior, promote more of those follow-up and care, prevention practices, learning how to learn that is important to have those prevention practices, such as, you know, conducting mammogram, learning to understand your high blood pressure, all of those things, providing that basic education, but so much more than that beyond that, that support um, and really helping them. One of my, the key things that promoters and community health workers do is really helping clients through complex health systems because there are so many barriers in those systems, so many ways to access, so many things that are requested that it's overwhelming for many clients or patients. So that is something that they do very well. Next. So I'm not going to read this, it's, it's a lot, but it basically the National Academy of Medicine is citing an innovation that says this is so a tremendous gain. But even though there is an ROI that it's demonstrated, basically here in the middle, we can read that their, their statement is that despite the promise of this innovation, has shown over the years and the recognition by many um, very recognized institutions, it is not something that is uh, mainstream in the US. The innovation that they're talking about is community health workers and more specifically, their integration into health-based primary care. And so there, this report that I'm sharing with you talks about how this innovation is just so promising and, and it is beyond understanding why it's not more widely utilized. Next. Here's a, uh, one that I like to cite. This was a, a statistic that Penn's Community Health Worker Program uh, just published in 2021, so just early this year. And here they demonstrate an annual return of investment of $2.47 for every dollar that was invested in Medicaid. Their program incorporated community health workers working with patients to address um, social determinants of health and really provide those support, those social support systems or outreach activities, patient advocacy and health system navigator. And once they incorporated this model, they were able to demonstrate an, um, an annual ROI. Next. So I want to talk a little bit about the Health Homes Program. Uh, this evaluation was just published in May of 2019. 2017. And this was an evaluation of the first five states that conducted the health home program. And I think the health home programs is amazing and does a lot to really help patients. But when it came to money and really comparing the money, in this report, they indicated that there was no significant savings in the beginning in the program. However, for clients who were in the program for a greater period of time, there was a significant uh, investment there. There was their services cost $200 less per person. In the next slide, um, we'd see that for clients who are duly enrolled, again, there was no significant uh, investment difference. However, when we look at patients who had been enrolled in the program, Again, they continue to say greater exposure, and they define that in the report as clients who were in the program for at least eight months. So for any client in the health homes program who was in the program for at least eight months, there was a significant reduction in investment. So for patients who were there for two, three months, there was no significant reduction. But the one thing that this report clearly states in the next slide, um, here in their conclusion, is that um, those clients who had longer and more stable health homes exposure, this is where they found significant reductions in overall Medicaid spending. 
So they're suggesting that the ability to engage patients is the key factor in performance when we look at cost savings. So cost savings obviously is critical, but we also want to make sure we have other health measures. So if we go to the next slides, um, we can see that in Missouri, their health home programs demonstrated lower um, emergency room visits for clients who were in the program for at least eight months. And again, all this is cited um, at the, in the next slide, we see several measures from they're able to show uh, an improvement in HA1C numbers in um, LDC and in high blood pressure. So they're demonstrated that patients who stay longer in the program have better health outcomes. Next. Then here is again, back to return on investment and actual money saved. And here um, there's a report by the uh, Association of State and Territorial Health Officials um, that published this report and it cites several models throughout the country that demonstrated an ROI. Uh, just mentioning the first one there in Maryland, a community health worker outreach program uh, saw a savings of over $2,000 per year per patient. And so you can see several models there and the report has the complete list. Next slide. So the, Brenda Lee mentioned the neighborhood navigator model, and I know we're almost at time, so I'm going to try and go as quickly as I can. And this is a model, um, it's called the Neighborhood Networks, and is with this um, annual Healthcare Quality Collaborative. Their name is also Be There San Diego, and this was a partnership that we initiated with the Chula Vista Community Collaborative at the time that I was still the director there. Next slide. This is a neighborhood. Yes. Take your time. People are very interested in what you're saying. It's fine if we go over. This will be recorded. We don't want to miss your very important presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I saw it was two o'clock and I was getting a bit more concerned. Thank you. Uh, and so the navigate. Thank you. So San Diego Healthcare Quality Collaborative developed this as a model of that would look at various programs. What I'm going to talk about today is the Health Homes Programs component of it. And this program was tr truly only made possible through partnerships and collaborations. So when that organization first approached um, the Chula Vista Community Collaborative, where as I mentioned, I was the director, and we began to to develop the pilot. We developed it as a pilot program. We really looked at what was the need? Who do we need to do this? Their intent was to, they're, they're responsible to find the funders, such as health plans, for example. Um, so they would contract with the health plan and be that, that neighborhood navigator hub. They would be responsible to contract with you know, one or two or more types of funders, such as a health plan, as I mentioned. They're responsible to manage the program. They do the necessary billing and reimbursement, and they're responsible for, as you know, this really requires some very strict data sharing and, and compliance and rules and regulations. All of that would have to be in place, and they're wonderful at really um, making sure that all the legalities are in place and that's the beauty of having someone as a hub, as a neighborhood navigator. Um, they're responsible to ensure everyone is trained appropriately and that there's comprehensive training and then contract out with smaller organizations, which as us, as the Chula Vista Community Collaborative, we were one of those community care organizations and we just would not have had the capacity to do the, the data sharing agreements, the billing, the reimbursement. So it really provided a benefit for us as the CCO as well. Next slide. Um, we saw the strengths of this model as being something that is already evidence-based. We're utilizing the community health worker model. We began with a group of community health workers that were already employed by the Chula Vista Community Collaborative as our promotoras. Um, it, it really focuses on having the promotoras engage with the client. And if you saw the results of the health homes program, those clients that are longer term engagement are the ones that clients that gain the most. So this model was based on doing home visits, on spending time speaking to the client, getting to know them. We always told our promotoras, the client has to like you first in order to really listen and, and work with you. So really developing those personal relationships. We developed a navigator comprehensive training 
and really looked at what are the skills that are necessary for the navigators to do the work that they needed to do. And it actually turned out to be a year long curriculum um, that I was very lucky to work with the San Diego Healthcare Quality Collaborative at, after I left the Chula Vista Community Collaborative and continued with them to do this work. Uh, they do an excellent job of providing clinical support, having a doctor and a social worker who are part of that team and can provide that support to the navigators when they have a patient that has multiple needs that they need a little bit more guidance then either um, a physician or social worker will will provide that support to them um, and some of it obviously is required through the health homes program but it is something that really is part of the team and benefits the providers there they they provide services from looking at what is needed to um, get this client to comply with um, doctor's orders to get them healthier to get them stabilized and then looking beyond that, what is needed for this client to continue to be well, to be able to practice um, prevention and overall be in a better situation and better health in the long run. Um, they truly really function as advocates for the client. We would get calls from them all the time or an email. This client needs this. How do we get this? This client needs that. I need this for my client. So it's really very much as them working for that client and, and everyone feeling like we were a team from each of the navigators to the hub, to the support systems to the organization. We all had to work together for each patient. It was very individualized to the clients. Next slide. Um, just sharing a, a report that was put out by the um, California Healthcare Foundation, and I just wanted to put that as a feature that was there. Um, our neighborhood navigators in the collaborative um, were based in the community that they served, and this was a model that helped us very much, and this is why they contracted with various community health organizations, community-based organizations, because San Diego County is a large county, and it was difficult for us in the South to help a client in the North if we didn't know all of the resources and the programs. So having partners in the various um, geographic regions really helped out. It, it's really intended to reflect the community that the promotores serve for them to be peers and be able to build that um, relationship with clients. And we know that community health workers and promotores, that's their natural ability to develop those relationships. Um, to be able to know their community, know the resources and the programs there so that they're better prepared to connect clients with those local resources. And the follow-up, the follow-up we found to be key for those community health workers to be able to follow up with the client, follow up with the referral, make sure that they got connected and, and advocate um, for them. And then the program, the San Diego Healthcare Collaborative uh, was responsible for tracking a lot of outcomes and having that centralized system and any communication with the health plans or funders. And Kitty Bailey is the executive director for the program, so I have her information there if anyone is interested in, in this amazing program through the San Diego Healthcare Quality Collaborative. Next slide. Next slide, please. So I was also asked to mention a little bit about the work we were done um, through COVID because COVID changed a, a lot of things. And um, we know that as community health workers and promotores, we had to continue to serve it. And we have to be at that forefront because the needs of the community were even greater during COVID. So some of the things that we've done with that is we began what we call wellness calls. And this is, again, everything that we do has to be through partnerships and through amazing collaboration. This was calling a school um, because we work closely with them and having the school provide us with a full list of all of their parents and all of their families in the school. We would get a list of 800 families and we would contact them and say, we're calling in to check in on you. How are you doing during COVID? Are you doing okay? Are you able to bring your kids in to get their lunches? Because the schools were giving out lunches. Are things working out okay? So we were proactively checking in on clients for the schools with the greater need. So those were our wellness calls. We also came up with Mask Mondays and we would give up masks um, to people and towards the beginning, if you guys can remember, it was hard to get masks. Um, and when they would come in to pick up the mask, we were able to hand them out the mask with a couple flyers of information of programs that, that needed to be um, shared or, or that were available to them through our telehealth programs, again, connecting clients on the phone and, and doing Zoom calls and doing Facebook Live and um, ways to really reach the community. Our promotors also worked um, heavily on food distribution sites, giving, giving out the food and collecting food as well. 
Um, they have been working on test, given clients testing information and assistance. It was really hard to go find out where do I get a test and how much should it cost that we kept hearing of people paying hundreds of dollars to test. So getting that information out there and now they're working on vaccine information and assistance and connecting clients to their vaccine appointments and, and really helping to advocate for that. Um, so that's just sharing a little bit about what we've done during COVID and then next slide. So now we look at how do, it's, we can see the value of community health workers and all that they bring in, but are we really truly integrating them? We, in order to do that, we have to recognize that they provide a value. They provide a value to the team because they're able to understand the real barriers that are faced by patients and clients. A patient will more likely tell the client, the promotora, the community health worker, why they're not doing what they're supposed to do, why they're not going on walks, why they're not exercising, all those things. And then the promotor can help them really understand their issues and, and be that mediator with the, the doctor, that mediation, that cultural mediation and social mediation is necessary. They do so much more than provide education. And when we have them as part of the team, but their role is just to go out there and give information, but they're not truly totally integrated. It's one way. They go out and give information to the patients. But it's important that they're valued as a member of the team and they're able to bring information back and share about this client. Um, we know that patients are so much better off when that community health worker, promotora, is really sitting at the table and contributing to the discussion about this patient. Next slide. So some, um, sometimes we want to say this is an amazing program, but how do we do it? How do we pay for it? So there, are, I just wanted to give you some examples, um, and there's many, and, and there's a report that's called How to Pay for It. Health Homes Program, as we mentioned, is, is explicitly focused on case coordination, on referrals, case management, and a lot of the work that the promotores do. The whole person care program also includes a lot of those benefits. There are some organizations that are doing what they're calling flip visits where the patient actually meets with the community health worker first and then goes in to see the, the provider. And that way they're able to pay for that because the provider is overseeing the community health worker. Um, and again, in this report, you can get more information on that. And then managed care organizations such as health plans, Health, some health plans are willing to pay if we can show that we can improve outcomes because they know they're going to save money in the long run. So looking at how to demonstrate improved outcomes to be able to pay for the investment. Uh, next slide, finishing up. So next steps, we want to make sure that we provide the opportunity to improve health outcomes by integrating the community health workers and teams and supporting you in doing that and ensuring that you're able to integrate the community health workers. So giving you more information about the model um, and some and uh, achieving health outcomes. So we have some training that is coming up that I'm working with Elisa at um, um, at US, USC. And so the training will be for agencies and for community health workers. And so I will be doing the community health worker training. Um, we're calling that community health basics. And this is health basics for community health workers and promotores. It will be on high blood pressure in English and in Spanish. And we will be doing a kit coordination training. We're actually going to be adding one that will be one in Spanish and one in English a couple or trainings that will be for agencies or um, providers and uh, agency staff on how to start a CHW program. So we're calling that a CHW program 101 and HR basics that will help you really understand how to even recruit, how to come up with a job description and all of those good things around hiring HR, um, CHWs. Next. And so I just, I, so I quoted a lot of um, different reports. So I wanted to make sure you have um, that um, access to all of those reports. They're really wonderful reports to give you lots of information about the community health worker model. Lastly, next, just thank you and uh, my contact information. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, for a fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, uh, two questions. One is, uh, I was intrigued by your flipped visits because for, obviously, how do you pay for this, you know, without going through a grant or a uh, 
healthcare uh, agency. Uh, but the flip visit seemed to offer something. Can you be more detailed on that? So they see the CHW person first, and then they bill that as a primary visit, and then the uh, provider after that uh, double bills, or how do you, how do you, is it a single bill submitted? How do you do that? And then the second question that was in our chat box was, how do, how do you uh, control for your navigators and your CHWs their scope of work so that they don't get, let's say, tempted to overextend their scope of work so they're giving more advice than perhaps they're trained for? So on the first, on your first question on flipped visits, I would encourage you to look at the report that has all of the information. I just obviously was putting all this together um, to give you that overview, but this is exactly why I wanted to make sure that I gave you that report so that you can read the specifics on the billing. What I understand from the model is that the, the I, it was more on the patient um, experience and their ability to meet with them and get them ready and understand all the things that have to be said to the doctor and then being more prepared for the doctor. But the billing part, it would be something to really look at. Um, it, it's a little bit beyond my scope. So okay. on your second question, that's really my scope um, on how to control the, the work that the promotores are doing. So part of it is, is when we train the community health workers, we really train them on social determinants of health. We train them on their role. We train them on the program. And so for example, for the health homes program, I, I've developed various trainings on that. And it's looking at each of the eight components of the health home program and what is included here and what do you do? And even talking, part of the training was including about boundaries and when it's too much and when it's not, um, it's not okay to do that. And so some of the research training that we've done that Brenda Lee mentioned is we've also talked about um, uh, you know how to stay true to, to your program and the fidelity to the program. So that is something that is specifically addressed because it is, it is something that promotores or community health workers want to help so much that many times want to do more than, than they should be doing. And so we do specifically train on that. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, I have, a, I have a question for uh, the last three speakers, Margarita, Brindale, and Oliver. I just wonder, could the women who are in the um, uh, special program that Oliver uh, presented, I keep wanting to call it Measure Up, Pressure Down, but that's Jerry Pento's hypertension program. Uh, uh, Oliver, would you unmute yourself and properly tell me the title of this program? Release the, pressure. release the pressure. Release the pressure. It strikes me that all these women that are in the Release the Pressure program could potentially be trained to be CHWs. And I'm wondering in your training for CHWs, what the cost of that training is and whether it could be made available to those who are, have signed up for Release the Pressure. Well, I'll speak. Uh, I think that it's it's a great idea because part of the goal of release the pressure is to have you know three hundred thousand take the pledge, but at the end have five million have normalized blood pressure by twenty twenty five. So the only way that's going to happen is something like an outreach that is beyond, above and beyond those that, that have actually taken the pledge. So I think that's a great thought, uh, Hattie. And certainly, so, when uh, uh, before giving the microphone to Margarita, in terms of the training, uh, uh, and this kind of follows the distinction between a peer support model and a community health worker. With a peer support model, uh, that that uh, not all CHWs are peer support, and not all peer support are CHW. And we can talk more about that. But certainly from the, for this particular project uh, that it was described uh, before us, I think that uh, we can move to a, a peer support model. And then some of those uh, can graduate into a promotora, a community health worker, because there are certain core competencies that will go beyond a, a specific disease or, or condition. And it will be more of a generalist 
So I think that taking a stepped approach from uh, being a participant in such a release the pressure project, uh, uh, conducting uh, and, and the, the pledge and actually uh, obtaining results there, they can move and transition to a peer support a training program, and then from those, some may graduate into a community health worker promotora, more specialist, more generalist, I'm sorry, a model. What do you say, Margarita? Um, I, I definitely, I agree. There's, there's various models, and we know that in California, there is no certification of community health workers. So there is not one training that says you become a community health worker after you take this one training. Those of us who this is what we do, we have developed our own. I developed the Promotores Academy in 2010, which is a 16 hour core competencies training that provides in the basics of how to be a community health worker, understanding social determinants of health. But um, and, and I know that San Francisco, LA, there's various organizations that provide training as well. There isn't one um, acceptable curriculum for the entire state. So it is really depending on what you're looking for. I have been working with um, Elisa um, Meyer here in the, in the team to provide some training for um, the Right Care Initiative and um, we have, I mentioned there's some high blood pressure trainings coming up. So I have been doing a, a lot of training around community health workers and navigators and develop the, the annual, the year curriculum for the program that we mentioned, but there isn't one set training, but I do I love the idea of these women taking some training to, to really understand the work of community health workers so that they can really be able to do that work. Can I extend that a little further? I, you know, we work with um, pharmacies in the community uh, to help um, connect with patients where they live, uh, knowing that pharmacies are fairly proximal you know, to, to many neighborhoods uh, with underserved patients. And uh, we've sort of uh, figured out that if we can train our pharmacy technicians to do more clinical work, the outcomes are night and day. And in some way, I see the pharmacy technicians as uh, providing some services that a community health worker can do even better. So, so I'm just wondering, is there um, some potential to train community health workers with some of the skills that a pharmacy technician might have and sort of create a super community health worker technician <laughs> who could be connected to pharmacies and help to make sure that patients get the most from their medication therapies? Is that something that uh, you think could work too? I definitely do. And actually part of the health home program is helping clients with medication adherence, for example, with even understanding their medications. They're not pharmacists and we would never want a community health worker to take the place of anyone else, a social worker, a nurse, a pharmacist, but they can be added to the team to add value, to really help to maximize the time and the efficiency of those professionals so that this, this community health worker can help that client understand oh, this is how my medication works. This is how, what I can ask, what I can do. So yes, I think that that's, that's exactly what we know that the community health worker model does. And it might answer some of your uh, challenges with sustainability because in our current partnership called the California Reitman's Collaborative, you know, we're partnering with health plans and pharmacies are receiving a value-based payment for helping patients to reach their treatment goals. And within that payment, it pays for the pharmacist services, the technical services. So if, if we get better results from partnering with CHWs, that becomes a sustainable mm -hmm. way to spread the model. Certainly. Thank you. And let me interject that I just added one link into the chat with some programs that are already making those connections between CHWs and pharmacists and working in the front line. So uh, also the, the National Association for CHWs is working with other um, stakeholder partner organizations on that. So just one very concrete follow-up question, if I may. Can you hear me okay? Yes. So yes. Um, uh, I really love the idea that you're doing this. I believe it's a complimentary training. Is that right? And do you have a limit to the number of people that can get the training? Or is it by video and open to all? Um. Uh, Lisa, if I, I, yeah, do you want me, yeah, I can, I can, I can speak up on that actually. So I put all the links in the in the chat for all the different trainings. Um, they do all have la um, caps, 
Um, so the blood pressure trainings are only 25 people per training. And then the, uh, all of the other ones listed are open to 50 people uh, per session. So it's not, it's not going to be unlimited. Um, as many as want to attend can attend. So if you are interested in sharing this with your organization, I would share it sooner rather than later. Strategically. So Dr. Brooks, I'm wondering how many women in your release the pressure campaign are in Los Angeles and maybe we could focus an outreach to your um, release the pressure group that signed up in Los Angeles since USC is sponsoring that training. Right. I, I don't know how many, but I could find out because, you know, we have there, they all have email connection and we you, utilize that to communicate. So it would be information going out to all of them and saying, you know, for those that are in LA who are interested in doing this. I like the, the thought of, of a peer peer support because that's that's what we're looking. They're not necessarily looking to be CHWs at this point in time, but a training as to how they could reach out to their quote unquote squad, as we call it. And then beyond that, the simple things, a lot of these are the younger women reaching out to their the, the elderly, well, the seniors in their, you know, in their families, the aunts, the grandmothers, the mothers. So that's that's the way I would do it, um, Patty, by just seeing a broad email and then with this information, I think it's a great idea. I mean, this linking, I mean, this is what Bright Care is all about. I think linking and networking, connecting one group with another. What a beautiful program. And I'm, I'm really excited about this. I, I thought um, a number really rang out to me and that was, I don't remember who said it, but this work is fairly well compensated, 25 something an hour on average. And I'm just thinking that these women who have been recruited into the release the pressure campaign might be really excited to get more engaged if they felt that they could do a training ladder that would get them into doing this as a profession. Um, so it could become really stabilized into the community, not just a volunteer thing. Just a thought. Good thought, really. And I'd love to see this also extended into the military and the um, uh, the intelligence community. And we don't have any military with us today, but I'd like to say on behalf of my late mother who died after being diagnosed with hypertension, uh, she was under a great deal of stress as a linguist for the National Security Agency. Um, and I know that it's a big issue in the military because these people are under such pressure they have such frightening conditions and maybe creating a program for training in that environment where it's life and death, uh, obviously something that's going to raise your blood pressure. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a group that I think deserves special attention. And that's one of the reasons we've developed our first pilot program in San Diego because of the big naval presence there to have those who've served the country be first in line for the best care available. So let's keep the creative juices going, let's keep the connections building, and let's get this spread to more, more people. And uh, today I learned that I, I better learn more about the mm. bottled water I drink. <laughs> This is just convenient. It's in a glass container, San Pellegrino. It's from Italy. It seems kind of extreme to bring in water from Italy, but it's just, it's in a glass bottle. And we all know from what Vito said and, and even uh, Dr. Andrew Weil that we need to be very careful about drinking water out of plastic. Um, so what a, what a mind expanding day. And with that, uh, Dr. Bomber, would you uh, wrap up our meeting and and thank our wonderful, amazing speakers and leadership. Well, I certainly want to uh, thank all of our speakers for our <clears throat> fight against disease and fighting on as uh, we did today. Uh, the one question on bottled water, which one to drink, there are independent assays of bottled water published by Consumer Reports and you can access that on their website. It is remarkable though, when you look at those numbers, how varied it is across the different manufacturers. 
Hmm. Some with uh, high numbers that you would want to avoid and others with very low numbers, all at different costs. So I would say anyone who is committed to bottled water, uh, you might want to read that as far as uh, picking which brand that uh, you uh, are comfortable with. And because it's independent, it's um, uh, hopefully uh, good, good information to be based on. Well, today we had fascinating discussions. We started out, uh, let's say, uh, uh, what, a billion years ago and traced through uh, population and roots to uh, humanoids uh, from 200,000 years ago uh, to uh, the industrial age with the introduction of uh, per perhaps a, a few more toxins than we need to have uh, around us. Um, and our adjustment to it. And I think the science is fascinating in detecting the causes for, for some of those uh, renal carcinomas that were described earlier from a weed that happened to grow and uh, perhaps uh, fall into the basket when they were collecting the grain uh, to actual toxins uh, that may relate to the agricultural uh, evolution that we've had with uh, fertilizers and pesticides now being rampant. You can go to any home improvement store or whatever and buy pesticides directly off the shelf and put them in. And who knows how those eventually get into the water supply that we have. So fascinating information and the implications on how, how it can affect all of us. Um, I hope this uh, slight <clears throat> step aside from our usual cardiovascular health, health has been helpful to everyone who is on today. And it shows the importance of the entire vascular system, which affects our entire body and the effects that it can have on our kidneys and the kidneys that may serve as a canary uh, of uh, warning that something's happening, on, happening in the vascular system. Uh, we did not talk a lot about treatment and for uh, renal vascular disease and kidney disease, we have a number of new um, uh, medications, including SGLT2s, ACE inhibitors, AR blockers, all of which have been shown to slow the progression of renal vascular disease in our individuals. And they have shown tremendous reduction in the progression of renal disease. Hopefully we'll have a session in the near future when we can talk about ways of actually intervening uh, on this. Today was the basic of prevention and lifestyle type modifications but we may uh, be able to uh, step one uh, step further and address some of the very positive trials that have shown a reduction in renal progressive disease uh, with medicines that are easily available or accessible today in much of the world. So we wanna thank everyone for their uh, presence. Uh, and congratulations on uh, doing a successful Mother's Day weekend. And we would like to announce that our next program in May, uh, the last Tuesday in May, is going to be uh, focusing on women's health. And it's gonna focus on women's cerebrovascular health and women's cardiovascular health with two great speakers. So please plan to join us uh, on that Tuesday, the I think the 24th, is it? Um, 20, of 25th, Tuesday, 25th, May 25th. of May, uh, where we have two great speakers that uh, will prove, I, I'm guaranteeing to be a fascinating topic by experts in their field. So thank you everyone for uh, your presence today and the uh, sponsors and the participants and the speakers who did an excellent job. And with that, uh, we'll sign off and let you have a great afternoon. All right, thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thanks everybody. Bye.